one very tired pair of legs here. I've been at West End Live all weekend, it's that time of year again and yeah basically if you're stood on your feet for like 11 hours that aches like hell and if you do it the second day as well you will know about it okay. You really need to get a camping chair or a little fold down job off for next year. Memo to self. Um, so yeah, West End Live! Woo! Uh, I had an amazing, amazing weekend. If you remember last year, which I don't know why you should, I did this like rundown blog in two parts. I did um, a blog about West End Live and I did a blog about the shows that I saw while I was down there and I've decided I'm going to do the same thing again this year just because otherwise I'll be talking for like two hours and ain't nobody wanting that, right? So yeah, first part of the blog is the two shows that I saw while I was down there. Two days, two shows. Well, I was there for three days, but you know what I mean, nothing happens on a Sunday. Um, yeah, went down to London on Friday so that I could have Friday night in the theatre. And Saturday night after West End Live, after a five guys, woo, I went to see 9 to 5. Weirdly, both of the shows I saw have numerical titles. So if you can't guess what the other one was, come do it now. I'll give a clue, it's not Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, that's not on. <laughs> so yeah, 9 to 5 was what I saw on Saturday. Um, written by Dolly Parton, as you can see. It started with this logo on the stage, like the alarm clock, and then the screen turned around in this clock and it was Dolly going, hi everybody. That was my Dolly Parton impression. Um, she was like, I'm the queen of country, you've got a queen in your country, and we've got some queens in the audience. <laughs> I loved her. Um, and she basically set out who the characters in 9 to 5 were, which is Judy. She is a young woman who has been um, dumped by her husband because he's run off with his secretary, Mindy, with an I. Um, she, she's brilliant. She's never had to work before. Um, her husband, Dick, has brought in the bacon. Um, and if you don't think that they can milk a dick joke, you don't know Dolly Parton. Um, <laughs> yeah, so she's the first character. Second character is Violet Newstead, and she was played by Louise Redknapp, who was amazing. I kind of thought that after Caroline Sheen had got such amazing reviews in the opening of 95, I was a bit concerned about having the name back, like, as it were because Louise has never really done a massive amount of musical theatre before but oh my god she's got an amazing voice and she's a brilliant actress and she was really funny like she was really really funny and she she, yeah, she did some really cool I'm not your girl I'm a woman treat me with some respect kind of moments and fair play to her yeah she was she was the, third, the second woman and then the third woman is um, if you've seen the film 9 to 5 which is this this just set to music really. Um, yeah, it's Doralee played by Natalie McQueen, who was perfect in every way. She was hysterical. She had giant boobs and blonde hair, and I bet you bet you can't guess who played her in 95. Um, uh, apparently when Dolly Parton came to the first rehearsal, Dolly went straight up to Natalie and went, I'd recognise Doralee anywhere. Which yeah. Um, yeah, she she she's basically Dolly Parton. And yeah, these are three women who work for a company who, which is run by a really, really horrible boss called Franklin Hart Jr. Played by Brian Connolly, who honestly was hysterical. Like, I was howling at some points, like properly, properly giving it some beans off him. And he's like misogynistic. He makes horrendous jokes where women are the punchline and they all hate working for him because he just, he goes, oh yeah, you're my girls, and then promotes all the boys. Um, kind of the big catalyst for everything that happens in it is there's a promotion that's up for grabs, and Violet is by far and away the most qualified person in the building to get the job. And she feels like she should get it, but she's like a bit worried about jobs for the boys, like he's going to promote a boy. And he does, he pre promotes a man that she actually trained. So she obviously knows the job inside out because she trained him to do it. But he promotes the boy because he's a man. And he even says, oh, he's got a home to run. And she's like, well, yeah, same. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's kind of horrible. It's set in the early 80s when the film came out. So there is a lot of like really big shoulder pads and really big hair and horrendous shoes, but in totally a camp brilliant way that you just like they look amazing. Um yeah, so basically everyone thinks that Dora Lee is sleeping with the boss because he lets them believe that. He makes all these jokes about her and she's the punchline to a lot of his gags and he does things like drop things in the office so she has to bend down and pick them up and he lets everyone think that that's what's going on. Um, so all the all the women in the office don't like Dora Lee because they think that she's getting preferential treatment by knocking off the boss, which she's not and she hates this because she feels so left out of everything because she's done nothing wrong and she can't get in with the boys because they think she's easy, she can't get in with the, the women because they think that she's she's you know doing this um and she's a bit out on the outside she's got a brilliant husband who's just like you're a good person you're a hard worker that's what you need to focus on and they'll they'll see it and yeah she finds that hard so anyhow one day it all comes out that she's not sleeping with the boss she didn't realize that necessarily everybody thought that um so yeah they they all make friends, the three main women, and they have a bit of a paddy because this promotion's happened, she thinks she's sleeping with the boss, the, the new girl's having a hard time because she's never had to work before, and they all go sit on the roof and fantasise about how they'd kill the boss if they could, like how they'd do it, and somehow or another, um, Violet goes and does the office shopping and she accidentally puts rat poison in Franklin's tea coffee I think it is it's American why would it be tea it'd be coffee and yeah so he has a little sip of it and spits it out and says it tastes funny so no harm comes to him but when his office snitch who was played by Bonnie Langford she oh, she was a wonder honestly she was a wonder um more on that to come let me finish my point um yeah when the office snitch kind of tells him oh you've drunk that poison she's tried to kill you he decides to let her think that that's what she's done. So she has a massive meltdown, goes to the hospital, tries to seal a body that she thinks is his, it's not. Um, and then they come back to the office to try and clean everything down and find him sat sitting in his chair, happy as Larry. And they're like, all three of them are like, we've done attempted murder, we've done all this terrible stuff, what do we do? So they kidnap him. Because why not? His wife's off on a cruise, so they take him back to his own home. And there's a brilliant bit, they, they go into his bedroom and he's got this remote control and Doralee's like, what does this do? And she presses one button and this cupboard flies open with all this like bondage gear in it and like harnesses and stuff and they're like... And then like the audience went crazy, proper laughed. And then she presses another button and there's a chandelier above the bed and it, the chandelier comes down and as it does, you just hear dun, 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 like the start of Phantom of the Opera and just an audience of musical theatre nerds just properly lost it at that, properly howled. So yeah, they string him up and decide to keep him hostage until they can decide what to do with him and that's how the first act ends. So the first act ends all the lights come on, 9 to 5 the logo comes back down to centre of stage and Brian Connolly's just there like swinging from a harness with this gag in his mouth and he spits the gag out and he's like Oi! Anyone gets the phone out, I'm coming down there to kill you. And the audience just proper, proper wet themselves laughing. So then the safety curtain comes down after a bit and we're all like howling, absolutely howling. You know, having our ice cream, having our drink, whatever. Um, not really thinking much more about it. And then the, the, the on track starts and the safety curtain's still down and I'm thinking to myself, you don't see a safety curtain very often nowadays. A lot of things are just open stage or, or you know, you get a big curtain down but not a safety curtain because I think it was mainly designed for like smoking and stuff which you don't do anymore so it's not a necessity, I don't believe. That is my understanding. So, yeah, that was a bit weird and then the safety curtain went up and this brain camera was still there like, and the audience just went mental, like everyone was properly, properly creased. There was a lot of times where the laughter was just deafening. It was so funny. Um, so yeah, the girls decide to see if they can make up any dirt on him. And at one point, um, <laughs> Violet says maybe we could hire a prostitute and get incriminating photos of him with a prostitute. 
Dorley goes, nah, he'll only like print them onto postcards and send them out at Christmas. I'll run for president. <laughs> and everyone was like, oi. <laughs> little, little Trump jive at you there, like Dolly Parton ain't having none of it. So that was good. And yeah, they decide to rifle through the accounts, see what they can dredge up on him, and they discover that he's been embezzling funds. <gasps> They've got it. So while they're getting um, like the information together to decide what to do, Violet basically runs the company in his absence and implements a load of things and Dora Lee can sign his signature so well because she's worked with him for years and they bring through memos about stuff like if you need medical help or rehab then that's available on company dollar um, you can put personal items on your desks again to brighten up the workspace you we're going to get you a table football table um there's a nursery now you can job share with other women if that makes your life any easier for childcare. you don't have to work nine to five if you don't want to you can work other hours or half a day or not a day at all and do it a different day that's cool um so yeah they basically bring about all the all the, the changes in the workplace that happened in the the that kind of era that the film set um so yeah that was that was cool and then basically he, he escapes, he gets down, but we've already got the dirt on him, they know he's embezzling the funds. And the big boss comes down who owns the company and he is like, this is amazing, productivity's gone up so much, what's your secret? And Franklin Hart's like, it's all me, it's all me, look, it's my signature on all these memos, I've implemented all this, and I'm amazing, I'm taking the credit. And the girls go, yeah, you're taking the credit for all this money that's gone into your account as well. And the boss, like the big boss says, we're opening an office in Bolivia now. Why don't you go down Bolivia? And you can run that office. Since you're doing so well here, we'll send you off to open somewhere else. So he gets sent off into war-torn Bolivia. And Violet gets to run the company. And she keeps all the changes that she's made. And it's a brilliant atmosphere. Work rate goes up. Everyone has a lovely time at work. Everyone gets what they want, basically. Uh, yeah, there's 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 a lot of really cool empowering stuff in there, um, but Bonnie Langford, I'm, I won't lie, I've never been a fan of Bonnie Langford. I find her and the Strallons a bit too stagey for me. They're a bit bit over much for my taste. Um, I think they're a bit old school theatre, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just it's not me. Um, and I'm a bit more of a kind of more modern, rough and ready you know, just off the street but got amazing talent kind of people and you know, there's nothing wrong with either of these things, it's just it's not, not my taste. Um, but in all fairness to the woman, and I looked her up, she's old enough to be my mother, she, there's a bit, she's in love with the boss, she's like his snitch, she's his ear on the ground and she's properly besotted with him. So there's a really cool bit where she's having this like fantasy of what she would say to him if she ever said that she loved him what would happen and it goes into like fantasy mode and this fantasy brian Connolly comes out in like a latin shirt and they have a bit of a dance and at one point she just whips her dress off and she's got like a basque and suspenders and these frilly knickers and and fishnet tights on underneath <laughs> and she does all this stuff like she she climbs on the back of the sofa and jumps and lands round his neck like with her legs around his neck like spread eagled oh my god she's 54 years old man and you know then he, he grabs her by the ankles and she's holding on to one of his legs upside down they're holding on to each other's ankles and she's still singing she, she was singing at one point she just dropped into the splits midway through How's that possible? That's not possible. I mean, it is because I've seen it, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, yeah. It, every, I, what I loved about it was it was very female led, which I know is so me, it's untrue. Um, but yeah, it was very, very female friendly. There was a lot in there where when you know he told the joke and a woman was the butt of it, the whole audience went, oh. Like the whole audience was just, nah, that's wrong. And we all cheered when um, Violet, played by Louise Redknapp, came and went, he, he said something about, that's my girl. And she went, I'm not your girl. I'm a grown woman. I'm capable of doing stuff. Da -da -da -da. And the whole audience was like, yes, yes. Um, 
and yeah yeah that was cool um i felt really like big and empowered after it it was feel good and we all know that i hate the phrase feel good when it's used in a derogatory term but that was feel good in like the best possible way I felt amazing after leaving that. I felt like I could do anything. I felt like Neville Longbottom on the bridge at the end of Deathly Hallows. That's how I felt. So yeah, there's a bit at the end because Dolly Parton at the um, at the, the the bit after the interval or um, at the introduction, she kept coming on the screen. Uh, she came on like three times or whatever during the show, and one of them was at the finale, and she was like, "Oh, gonna have a bit of where are they now?" So. Nobody had heard from Franklin Hart again. He was out in the jungle with his machete, battling on in Bolivia. Um, Bonnie Langford's character, Roz, had pined for him for a bit and then reconnected with an old friend on social media who happened to be his wife and now they were together. So that got a big cheer. Um, the new girl, Judy, she was on The View, which Dolly Parton said is like loose women but with big hair. And she had made a fortune on the back of her book called Life Without Dick. <laughs> yep. Um, Violet was um, running her own company, so that went down really well. She had got what she wanted. She was running the show. Um, Dorley was um, a brilliant, empowered businesswoman. Her husband Wayne said that she should run for president, but she decided that there were bigger boobs in the White House. <laughs> Another Trump joke. Well done. Dolly Parton does not like like him, does she? Um, that got a massive cheer, incidentally. Massive, like, huge cheer. Uh, rightly so, frankly. So, yeah, that was good. And I just loved it because at the end of it, the women that had fought and worked hard got everything that they should get. And the man that was holding them down, you know, I want to move ahead, but the boss won't seem to let me, he was nothing anymore. Loved it. Loved every second of it. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend 9 to 5 because you will have 9 to 5 stuck in your head forever. No two ways about it. I've been walking around for like two days going 9 to 5. Um, but yeah, there's so many great other songs in it as well. Uh, Get Out and Stay Out where Judy's husband comes and wants her back because he's noticed that she's really confident and empowered and brilliant now. Um, and Mindy's left him, obviously. She says, no. She's like, get out and stay out. And sings this song about, I'm taking back my life. You've just used me and I'm not having it anymore. That got a massive cheer. Um, everything where the women basically went, we're done with you. That, the audience went mad. The audience went mad. That is what I love about the West End. It's so, like, it's so empowering. It's the, the atmosphere in any show you go see is one of do do the right thing, be a good person, don't hold others back, be you. And 95 was that in spades. So fair play to Dolly Parton, that was incredible. Go see it, go see it, thoroughly recommend. Um, yeah, on the subject of Queens um, and the other numerically titled musical I went to go see, on Friday night was Six, which... Um, only opened like last year, I think last year's West End Live, I'm going to have to check my blog, um, they were on but it was the first time that the six queens had performed together, like there wasn't, they, they weren't in costume, they'd only just started rehearsal and everyone really really liked them um, but we didn't know that it would be this big at the time, it was like, and now that I think about it, watching this last year, I feel like I witnessed the birth of something incredible. I feel like I did the previous year when I witnessed the birth of Jamie. Always stay for that three o'clock slot, people. You never know what you're going to see. So yeah, six. Oh my god. I mean, I, I mean, obviously I have a history degree, so history is kind of my bag. But I do genuinely have a favourite queen, and that is Catherine of Aragon. And the whole point of this was to spend the show saying, who's your favourite queen? Let's decide once and for all who was the most hard done by, who did Henry treat the worst, who deserves to have the place in history as as the queen of all queens, okay? Um, it's brilliant. It's, it's not like watching a traditional musical in a lot of ways. It's a bit like... Um, 
it's been like the best way I can describe it is if the Spice Girls were Tudor Queens. That's what that's what I saw. Um, it's at the Arts Theatre, which is the smallest theatre in the West End that I've been to, but it's probably now one of my favourites to be honest because you cram so much atmosphere into such a small space it feels really intense and exciting. Um, I think, I don't know how many it holds, I would estimate probably about 400, 450. If there's 500 people in that room I will be amazed, frankly, if that's how. And there isn't an orchestra pit or anything breaking up between the audience and the stage. There's a live band on stage for this the whole time. Um, it's an all-female band, of course. And yeah, the front row were literally practically knee to stage. And I was on the second row. And they interact with the audience a lot. They break the fourth wall a lot. Um, Catherine, um, um, do I mean Catherine Parr? Who was it? No, it was Anne of Cleves got one of the audience members up dancing with her. She was like, during Get Down, she was, she was dancing with her. Um, yeah, they, they interact, they look at you. Like, Catherine of Aragon, when she was, like, introducing everyone, was like, oh, you think you know us? She, like, got down on her knees and she, like, looked me in the face and went, you remember me from your GCSEs? I was like, I do, I do. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, everybody's done Tudor-wise, haven't they? Um, and everybody does know divorce beheaded died, divorce beheaded survived. But like, there's so much more. And this is why I always love Catherine of Aragon. I think she's a brilliant, brilliant woman. And the whole point of this show is they start off by saying who's the best, who's the most hard done by, da, da, da. And they basically decide to take it in turns. And they're like, right, we're going to let you decide, audience. We're going to sing some songs and you're going to learn all about our lives and you're going to work out who's the best. So there's not necessarily a narrative as such it goes in wife order if you like um and they all sing a song so it starts with no way by Catherine of Aragon who's saying oh you you went out and, and had a song with another woman okay you you go out and have affairs okay you think it's weird that I'm your brother's wife and I don't speak a word of English but I've had to learn for you okay you want a divorce no way uh so yeah that's her song about all how she's been had done by Anne Boleyn sings Don't Lose Your Head um, and she, she makes a joke at the end about I guess Henry really liked my head <laughs> oh, that made me laugh uh, Jane Seymour is the one who was like but I really loved him actually and I wish I'd stayed around for my son I'm sad that I died and didn't get to see him grow up and and help him and look after him and be there for him and yeah so she sings Heart of Stone and then they all um, sing House of Holbein <laughs> in, in what can I describe as probably a slightly dodgy German accent, but it's brilliant. Um, which is about how Henry was trying to choose a wife after Jane Seymour died. So they went to Hans Holbein and said, G -g -g I want all the pictures of the eligible princesses of Europe. And Holbein sent him all and he chose Anne of Cleves. Um, they do a brilliant thing on the stage where they light it up, whereas if he swiped left or swiped right on them. God, that's funny. Um, then Anna of Cleves sings Get Down, which is basically about, oh, yeah, I'm really had done by because he didn't like my face, so I got to live in a palace at Richmond and basically do what I want. Oh, yeah, really had times. And all the queens at the end of it are like, why are you saying that's bad? And she's like, I'm not, I had it great. <laughs> but she thought I was ugly, so I got to like, be the king's sister and have all this money. Tough times. Um, yeah, I, I loved her even more at the end of it because I was like, fair play, Anna, fair play, <laughs> can't fault you for that. Um, yeah, she's brilliant. Catherine Howard sings All You Wanna Do, which is about how all the men in her life from when she was like 13 basically just used her for and, and had a, a, she had a pretty face, so they all kind of used and abused her a little bit. Um, she says at the end of it about how she was like a secretary to somebody and you know, took all his notes for him and all that, and she was like, oh, in Tudor times, men in power would hire secretaries just to get him in the private chambers. Different times. Yeah, that got a big, big whoop, as you can imagine. Very much a theme for my weekend is is that, isn't it, really, now I think about it? Very much themed it. Didn't think about it, but yeah, that's what it was. Um, 
Catherine Parr sings I Don't Need Your Love, which is how she had to sack off the man that she was going to marry because Henry wanted to marry her. And if the king says, I'm going to marry you, you don't say no because he has a history of lobbing people's heads off. So, yeah, probably not the best to have an argument with him. And so it's, it's all about how she had to write to her fiancé because they were going to get married and say, oh, I can't be with you. I've got to marry the king. Which is really, it was really sad. Like, you don't think about that. I mean, I knew that. And then she sings in there about how it's really sad that everybody knows her as the one who survived, as if she's famous just for living. When actually she, she championed women's rights and women's education. She made it, you know, available for women to study scripture. And she wrote, she wrote things. She wrote lots of, like, Protestant pieces and, and psalms and... She had women paint her portraits so that they got some acclaim as opposed to like Holbein and people like that. She she championed women in in different aspects of life that got them noticed and made men go, oh okay, they're, they're quite good at that. So that was amazing because I'd, I'd sort of knew that about Catherine Parr but I didn't know it all that much. So to hear a bit more about that was great. That was, I think that was important. And th that was the whole point of the show, that we know them as Henry the Eighth's six wives, but we don't know anything about them. And then after that song, they all get together and basically said that, like, do you know who Henry the Seventh's wife was? And I'm thinking, yeah, I do. It's Elizabeth of York, but I get that. I'm in the minority of the audience that know that. And do you know who Henry the Sixth's wife was? Do you know who Henry the Fifth's wife was? Like, that's all we are. We're one of six. And then one of them says, wait a minute, if we don't know who the other king's wives are, aren't we important for standing out? What do we know about Henry VIII? What do we say after Henry VIII? Henry VIII and his six wives. We made him. We made him the king he was. We made him in history. They say at one point history is, like, totally ruled by the patriarchy and it's a men's perspective that give you historical discourse which I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> as, as, you know, someone who studied history and is a woman, like, oh my god, yes, thank you for saying it out loud in a musical, that was incredible, the whole entire audience went ballistic, like, I cried, just cause, cause stuff like that just gets me, I was like, well enough, um, yeah, and then they sing Six, which is the title song, which they then say, what could we have done if we hadn't have had him bringing down our lives? Let's rewrite history. Let's have her story instead. Why does it have to be his story? Let's have our tale of all the things we could have achieved. So yeah, they they sing about what their lives would be like if they could whip it up and change it. So um, Catherine of Aragon rejects Henry's proposal, goes to live in a nunnery and creates an amazing choir. Anne Boleyn gets sent green sleeves as a poem, changes it all, puts it on a stick beat and writes lyrics for, for famous artists like Shakespeare. <laughs> Jane Seymour lives and has loads of kids with Henry, because that's what she wants, which fair enough. Um, Anne of Cleves, she goes back to the House of Holbein and basically does a tour with him about, oh, hey, I'm Anne of Cleves, and you know, brings the party, everybody gets down. Um, Catherine Howard, when her first music teacher, when she was 13 and he was 23, tries it on with her. Instead of like going with it, she goes, no, I'm actually going to be a lyricist and sing and dance and do all this instead of you. So she does that. And uh, yeah, Catherine Parr puts together the band. Because she brings together women and champions women in the arts. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. I thought it was phenomenal. And what I loved about it was there was different stories in there about what they would have wanted to do. One of them did want to be a wife and mother and that was fine. That was cool. One of them did want to just go into an honorary and have that, that life and that was fine. One of them wanted to go out and party. That was fine. All of them were like, do you know what? This is cool. This is everything. And I, I thought that was phenomenal. I thought it was amazing at the end where they basically said, let's flip it around. You only know Henry because of us. Why does it have to be that we're second to him? Why shouldn't you know about us? 
Anne Boleyn brought about the Church of England, which is still... The Queen is the head of the Church of England now, 400 and odd years later. No, Anne Boleyn's important in history. Why does she just have to be divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived? She brought about religious change. And it was like that with all of them. Like, everybody had that impact about why history or her story had changed because of them. And I thought that was brilliant. And it was, it, you learned a lot. It was educational as well. Phenomenal. So yeah, absolutely, if you get the chance to go see Six, or even if you just watch their Western Life performances from the weekend. Oh my God, I really want to go see that again. Really want to go see it again. I felt like I've been to the best concert of my life watching that. I'd watch that again tomorrow. So twice at Western Live, they did both days, and then I saw it on a Friday night as well. So I have, I have like, heard songs from it three times this weekend, and honestly, that is not enough. We need more musicals like this, please. They are my queens. These and Dolly. Queen-filled weekend.